these people during the year. Sometimes we have needs for extra hands on deck during the course year. And there's also an externship program in Smith that we work uh, through with our office, you know, where you can come in and, and actually handle cases when you're a third year. Yeah. Which is a great experience. If for nothing else, you can either see, oh my God, I love this and I'm never going to leave and this is what I want to do, or you can run screening for the building like we had happen with that and never <laughs>
that we have to make sure we're working together with them. Because we may think we know what the solution to the problem of domestic violence is, but until you talk to a woman who's been victimized by it, until you talk to a mother whose child has been murdered or whatever, or whose child has joined a gang. And you know, these, these are parents that have done the right things their whole life, and made the right decisions, and gotten their child a good education, and they're still joined a gang. We've got to make sure we're having that dialogue and figuring out that we're not missing a huge gap out there. So we are more political in that sense, but not with the, you know, and in my naive, rose-colored way of looking at things, not in the, the sinister, nasty way that that word sometimes, you know? I, I make a lot of decisions that are not popular. I have to. Um, and I've been doing that for 20 years. That's not new to being the DA. I mean, even as a prosecutor, we have to see. You know, somebody told me when I was uh, appointed that to be the U.S. Attorney, and I understand y'all got to hear from wonderful Ed Stanton today. It's great. Um, to, to sit in that office or to sit in my office, you basically have to be prepared to indict your mother. And that's, you know, that kind of kicks you in the gut when you hear that, but that's, that's the reality of it. And is it always the, the popular decision? No. But it, it's what's best for the community down the road. Um, you know, we've got an, an officer that was arrested this week pulling a gun on his wife on Valentine's Day. A major in the police department who I have known for my entire career. And does that just make you want to cry when you get that call from Director Godwin? Yeah. But my office still has a job to do. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think oh. anybody else? Yes, ma'am. No. Have you ever prosecuted a case and you later they found evidence that they were wrong? And they were convicted. That's an awesome question. <laughs> Listen to this great story though. I tried a guy named Stephen Faison a few years ago. There were some, there were two women's uh, skeletal remains that were found by the Mall of Memphis. Remember when they knocked over the Mall of Memphis and then they started bulldozing it? Well, two of the guys who were in charge of driving that big machinery one hot summer day thought, this doesn't look like a normal rock, and they realized they were digging up dead bodies. Investigation by the Memphis Police Department, and we indicted Stephen Faison for murdering those two women plus another woman whose dead body was found in an abandoned house on a street, just kind of a stone throw from the Mall of Memphis. And I had Stephen Faison's fingerprints on a liquor bottle that was found by the head of this woman. And this woman was found wearing nothing but a sweatshirt. It was pulled up, exposing her breasts, and she was naked everywhere else down. She was a crack prostitute who just, you know, walked the streets hoping to get drugs and doing whatever she needed to do to get the drugs. I had Stephen Faison's fingerprint on the liquor bottle, plus I had witnesses who said they had seen him with her earlier in the night and they were fighting and he drug her in that abandoned house and that's where everybody in the neighborhood went to smoke their crack. I also had, this is a little bit of a problem, I had unidentified male DNA on the collar of her sweatshirt but I thought, you know, she's a prostitute. Who knows how many men she'd been in contact with that day or even more where the hell that sweatshirt came from. You know, who knows? So, went to trial, lost. And that was my strongest case. I really didn't have much linking him to those two skeletal bodies at the Mall of Memphis, other than that he knew them and had been seen with them. But, you know, again, strategy and being the prosecutor and trying to, to do the, the best thing, I tried my strongest case first and thought, well, if we win that, then these other two aren't going to matter that much. We couldn't find family members on any of those. Anyway, so got my teeth kicked in. I lost that case. And I thought, oh, whatever. That's all right. Life goes on. You know, the tears shed. Come on, drink a glass of wine. Everything's there. All right. <laughs> so I go back about my business as being a trial attorney and, you know, deep in the throes of running the gang unit and all of that. And then I get a call from an MPD detective who works their cold cases. And he called me and I looked in one. He said, hey, do you remember Steve Faison? He called me red. He said, hey, do you Pose is this big giant 
scary database thing that puts people's DNA in there when they get booked into prison. And then if it matches with some cold, unsolved cases, some magic noise goes off and law enforcement all over the country is notified. They got a POTUS hit on some guy that was doing time in Louisiana on another case um, that matched the unidentified male DNA on her sweatshirt. Now, still not a great case, but the point is I was supposed to lose that case. That was not a strong case. It was one of those ones that I didn't feel comfortable as a prosecutor um, kicking because I thought he probably, I knew he had been with her and I knew they had been fighting and he had confessed to, you know, hitting her and all these other things but just hadn't confessed to killing her. There was, there was more to it than that. So I felt confident in prosecuting him given what we had, but, you know, call it divine intervention or what have you, it wasn't supposed to be. Now, will we be able to indict this other guy? I don't know, because it's still not a strong case on him. It's kind of the reverse. We've got the same problem. We've got Stephen Case's fingerprint on a liquor bottle. And yeah, we've got his DNA on the sweatshirt. But um, other than that, no. I've never, I've never put anyone in prison or on death row. And let me just say this about capital litigation. I've done a lot of it. I have never ever, and my office doesn't, seek the death penalty unless we know this person did it. You don't play around with the death penalty. You don't play around and say, I'm pretty sure this is our guy, but I'm just going to go on and file that death notice and see if the guy will plead. Uh -uh. Once you put your name on that and file that motion, game on, and you better be ready to play. And that it's just, it, the stakes are too high, and it's, it's the ultimate. It's, you know, you can have a whole course on um, capital litigation, but it's, it's nothing that any of us as prosecutors take lightly in terms of, of that. Thank you. Thank you. But no, I don't, I don't, nobody's ever gone to prison on my watch.